Can I start? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So hi everyone. Um, so I'm Pratik and uh, I'm with Sebastian and we'll be talking about a paper that we recently published in ACL 2020 called the state and fate of linguistic diversity in the NLP world. So, um, uh, this was done with Amar Gudiraja, who was a previous research fellow at Microsoft Research, and Kalika and Monajit, who are currently principal researchers at Microsoft Research. Uh, first of all, we would like to thank Liz and Abhilasha and the whole NLP with Friends team for giving us the opportunity to give this talk here. And um, I think one interesting thing is that uh, we I feel that the fact that we are presenting in this talk is pretty apt uh, because me and Sebastian have been friends since college and we joined Microsoft Research together. So we have literally been doing NLP with friends. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so just, a, uh, yeah. So just a bit of background about how we came to this uh, problem, like project problem. Uh, so MSR India has been working on low resource languages for quite some time now. And there is a focus on Indian languages and specifically one language called Gondi, which is a severely low resource language in the Gond community. Uh, and uh, this is a good example of a low resource language because it has 3 million speakers, a, a long history of people Con, like conversing in that language. However, till now there isn't even one monolingual corpus available for that language. Uh, some other interesting challenges about the Gondi language is that it's a primarily spoken, not a written language. And this becomes a bit tricky when you uh, try to build a text-based corpus, um, let alone like, you know, like make an NLP model for Gondi, a text-based NLP model. And this similar challenge exists across languages all over the world. So for example, um, David Adelani in his NLP with friends talk mentioned um, Bambara, which had a similar challenge of being primarily spoken, not written. So after working, uh, so we worked on a few uh, projects before arriving to this problem. So me and Sebastian uh, worked on surveying the different challenges which come with building and deploying language technologies for low resource language communities. Uh, we took two languages in India, Gondi and Mundari, and we looked at which we had all, like which MSR had deployed a particular language tools already in that community. And we saw and, and like discussed what problems um, and obstacles these teams had to overcome uh, to be successful. Uh, the second paper which Sebastian worked on was a case study on Gondi about different technological interventions such as creating children's books, different digital content for Gondi, and how in the process they collected data and also increased information access for Gondi. Uh, finally, um, I worked on uh, a project which uh, in which we created a, a crowdsourcing platform for and collected Marathi speech data, which is another uh, Indian language and uh, relatively mid to low resource. And we looked at how we could um, get help from low income workers uh, so that to, to crowdsource this speech data. So that not only, and the benefits are like twofold. So not only do we provide a secondary stream of income for low income workers, but we also get crucial diverse data, which includes different dialects and different slangs, which um, uh, people in different Marathi communities use and make ASR models more inclusive and make them more robust. So um, after working on these problems, we kind of realized that there was an impending overall issue um, in NLP research. And that was that only a few languages were getting the spotlight in NLP research. And there were a lot more languages which weren't getting enough attention uh, at all. So we 
we we a similar sentiments you know kind of were echoed when we had various discussions in the msr uh, group and via many many researchers on twitter who advocate for in more inclusion so for this we decided to quantitatively analyze how stark this disparity was between languages in the nlp research spotlight and those which aren't getting enough attention and we felt this was a good timing for two reasons so the first reason was this we started thinking about this in last uh, september october time and that was when the pre training wave bert roberta m bert was really taking the nlp research scene by storm um so we wanted to analyze whether the pre training wave would actually benefit like the zero shot transfer wave would actually benefit these low resource languages and if they did how much and the second thing was that uh, the theme for acl 2020 was about taking stock of where the community is and where it is going so we felt that a problem like inclusion of different languages and how the community is progressing in this aspect is quite important so coming to the paper that we worked on so let's take a look at the actual state of nlp research so if we take two example an example of two languages dutch and somali we can see that they have a relatively similar number of speakers but if we take the number of linguistic or nlp resources they have in ldc the linguistic uh, data consortium catalog and elra uh, there's a stark difference and uh, dutch has well performing high performing translation systems whereas somali has very few and subpar translation systems so to ground this with an example we can look at this sentence uh, the tiger moved across the grass if we do an online translation of this into dutch and then back we get the sentence that we desire but if we do the same for somali uh this is an exactly the same thing so if we look at the number of papers over the years in top tier nlp conferences involving these languages we can see that this disparity still exists so we asked this uh, a bit of a complex question how has the fate of different languages changed with the current language technologies and we break it down into five more concrete questions so one how many resources are available across the world's languages and do they correlate with the number of speakers two which typological features have nlp systems been exposed to and which features have been underrepresented three how inclusive has acl been in conducting and publishing research for different languages uh, four does resource availability influence the research questions and publication venue and finally what role does an individual or a research com uh, research community have in bridging the resource divide so to get an idea of the digital resource status for different languages we constructed a taxonomy based on two simple features uh, and we did so because we we wanted to build them on basic features and see whether the same taxonomy would be reflected in different more in depth analyses that we did so on the y axis we plot the available label data and for this we take the amount of resources in the ldc catalog and the elra map uh, on the x axis we take the amount of unlabeled data so in this case we use wikipedia pages because a lot of pre training language models use the wiki dump as uh, unsupervised training data so we get six classes uh, as you can see on the right the spectrum from violet to red corresponds to the total speaker population size and the size of the circle itself corresponds to the number of languages in each class so looking at the classes in more detail we get six languages so class 0 uh, we 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 refer to them as the left behinds these are very low resource languages which have no label data and 
barely any unlabeled data to make a difference. Uh, there's going to be a lot of efforts which will be required to shift the landscape for these languages. Then we come to class one, which is a scraping bias, which have a decent amount of unlabeled data, but insufficient labeled data to train on downstream NLP tasks. Uh, class two, we call the hopefuls because they have a decent amount of unlabeled data and labeled data. And within a few years of active progress, uh, these languages can be in a much better state. Uh, class three uh, are the rising stars because they have a lot of unlabeled data and enough labeled data, and they can be propelled forward by the pre-training wave, uh, which is happening. Uh, then class four are the underdogs, which aren't the primary target choice for data-driven research. Uh, in the overall community, but they have very high performing language technologies. And then finally, we have the winners, uh, which have a lot of resources and they are the target choice for the NLP community. Uh, and they, they have state of the art models and they tackle complex NLP problems like question answering and summarization. Um, at least they tackle these, uh, their benchmark data sets with high performance. So some of the upfront findings when we constructed this taxonomy is that there is a large population of speakers who do not have access or very insufficient access to language technologies. And this not only creates a technological or communication barrier, but a bigger problem is that it can potentially lead to the extinction of that language. Uh, one uh case is gondi so in the gond community mm, due to the severe lack of digital content uh, available and not, not enough reading material in the digital sphere coupled with the overall like problem of the bigger problems of no medium of instruction in gondi being provided to children a lot of people are moving to a mo more mainstream language like Hindi, where there is a full stack and there are enough resources online to educate. However, now that there has been some digital content revival like uh, Pratham books, which have been creating children's books in the Gondi language, uh, things are slowly starting to get better. So the next thing we looked at was distribution fairness. Uh, we can see that in the three resources, LDC, Catalog, LRE, Eldra Map, and Wikipedia, uh, there is a heavy tail, there is a skew, and the classes, uh, I mean, the languages kind of line up according to their classes. And we did this, uh, we did a similar plot for the number of web pages, and the languages again line up according to their classes. So, after this, we decided to do a, a set of more in-depth analyses to figure out whether this disparity is reflected in those as well. So the first one we did was on typological representation. So uh, just a bit of basics, uh, what is a typological feature? So they, it is a structural or functional property of the language. Uh, so to just show two examples of typological features, the first one is the order of subject, object, and verb in a sentence. So this is a feature. And within each feature, you have a number of categories. So for English, we have the category of SVO, subject, verb, object. So Bob ran to the hospital. Uh, and then in Hindi, we have SOV. So Babu, Aspatal, Bhaga. Bhaga is ran, Aspatal is hospital. And then in Irish, we have VSO, which is pretty interesting. So I'll try to pronounce this, but Re, Brian, Haig, and Hospital. So Re is Ran and Hospital is Hospital. So this is actually uh, one example and an example of a feature for which English does not represent is uh, reduplication. So reduplication isn't present in English. Uh, so basically reduplication is when you have the root of a word, uh, the stem or the whole word being repeated for some form of emphasis. And it's very prominent in Indian languages. Uh, and you can, uh, like in Indian languages, you can refer to them as echo words. So they're repeated twice for a different effect. 
So in Hindi, we say garam garam chai, which is hot, hot chai. So like it's very hot. In Kannada, you say swalpa, swalpa, which is little, little. And in Marathi, which is my mother tongue, uh, if you want to ask where all are you going to go, you say kute kute zana re. So here kute kute is repeated to say where all. But in English, we don't really say where, where are you going? So just two examples. And there are many other typological features. So, so what we wanted to see was whether NLP systems have sufficient representation of different typological features uh, based on the data that they've been trained on. So we took the walls database, which has the largest uh, is the largest um, one of the largest databases for typological information. Uh, it represents more than 2,500 languages, and it has around 192 typological features. Um, and we, what we did is we split the two languages. So, I mean, we split the classes into two buckets. So for class zero, one, two, we take them as ignored classes because they don't have sufficient resources. And then class three, four, five, have a lot of resources. Then we look at the typological categories. So like SOV, VSO, uh, and so on. That's just for one feature. And the number of categories which are present in 0, 1, 2, but not 3, 4, 5. And we refer to them as ignored categories because these categories are not well represented in the data which is currently available. Then we look at the typological features with the most ignored and the least ignored categories. So looking at the most ignored feature, which is 144E. So it has a total of 23 ignored categories um, and around 38 languages which have that feature. Uh, so 144E is multiple negative constructions in SVO languages. Um, I, I don't have an example to substantiate this, but uh, languages like Icelandic and Wolof contain uh, uh, this feature. Uh, and we can see that the languages containing this feature are spread out over various regions. They're not restricted to a particular country. Uh, and overall, this can be an issue when we try to zero shot transfer between resource rich languages to resource poor languages. Because um, if resource rich languages don't have um, a representation of these categories, they won't transfer well. And this was demonstrated empirically in Perez et al. So one more finding that we came across was that uh, we looked at a previous work by RTJ and Schwenk, and basically they attempt to zero shot transfer um, for different languages uh, using a pre-trained multilingual model. Um, and we, so the error rate uh, numbers for their, uh, in their paper for English to a particular language is mentioned here. Um, yeah, and we can see that the ignored, the one languages which have a high number of ignored features like the one shown here have a pretty high error rate. And they, again, belong to classes one, two, which are not very well represented. Uh, one more interesting finding was that Amharic, Arabic and Amharic are two of the most spoken languages in the Semitic family. Uh, and Amharic has a high number of ignored features. And again, therefore a high error rate and Arabic has a very low error rate. So this shows that there are typological nuances between languages of the same family. And we can't really expect to, uh, expect to predict that languages in the same family might have similar zero shot performance. Right, now I'll hand it over to Sebastian to continue from here. Yeah, can you see my screen? Yep. Yeah, uh, so Pratik already talked about the different languages, their distribution um, uh, across different parts of the world as well as their resource availability. So what I'll be talking about is more from the perspective of how language inclusion is in different conferences. So uh, why is this an important question? Um, 
Um, the reason is that language technologies are primarily driven by NLP research. Uh, so NLP research, uh, especially with the advent of pre-training wave, as well as the massive multilingual models, uh, is that uh, it's kind of becoming very data intensive. And uh, one more thing which can be observed is that the more the research is done for a particular language, the more resources are getting developed. So the issue here is that the languages which did not have a good set of resources to begin with are suffering and kind of falling in this vicious cycle, right? Uh, one of the examples which Pratik already took was that of uh, Gundi. So, for example, if there are no language technologies which are getting developed for, uh, say, Gundi, uh, the children who are uh, uh, children who are belonging to the Gun community wouldn't be able to uh, kind of uh, be exposed to these. Uh, the language in other mediums other than the mother tongue. And this can probably, there is a good uh, chance that this can lead to extinction of that language uh, in some time. So, yeah, before I kind of move on, I want to give a primer to the different conferences which are uh, there in the NLP world. I mean, a lot of people would already know about this, but still some interesting facts like. Uh, ACL, NACL, EMNLP, EACL are the most uh, known conferences, I think. Um, ACL started in around 1979, ACL in 83, and uh, NACL and uh, EMNLP around 2000s. So they have kind of migrated towards a more empirical approach. Uh, the CL uh, is the Computational Linguistics Journal, more focused on computational linguistics and its theory. Uh, it started around 1974. Uh, Coaling started in around 1965. It's the oldest conference uh, in NLP. Uh, then we have uh, LREC, which is primarily focused on language resources or multilingual research. Uh, it started in around, was established around 1998. Uh, WS is the workshop proceedings, uh, which uh, were uh, in the different conferences since 1977. So uh, one of the first things which we wanted to see is how the language occurrence is changing over the years for different conferences, right? So I'll kind of illustrate this through uh, uh, an example. So in this case, I'll take uh, ACL 2019. Um, we have a set of papers, say N papers, and then we have a set of uh, uh, languages which we are interested in. So these are the same set of languages which were there in the uh, world database, so around 2,400 languages, um, if I'm not wrong. So, uh, so what we have is like for each paper, we have a binary list of whether a particular language was mentioned at least once or not. So in this case, if I take an example of paper one, um, German is mentioned like at least once or uh, Spanish is mentioned once or Italian is mentioned once, right? So now that we have a set of these binary lists, what we do is take uh, some of these values, uh, which kind of gives us a distribution of language representation over different papers in that conference. Now that we have this distribution, we calculate one value, that's the entropy. So the reason we go with entropy as a metric is first of all, it gives us a single unified measure for, uh, for that, like for a particular conference iteration. Uh, and the second reason we go for entropy is that uh, it gives us the skew of how the language representation is in a conference. So now that we have this entropy metric, we calculate uh, this across different years. So this is a plot of ACL. So it starts from 2.1 in around 1979 and goes to around 4.1. So uh, one thing which we can say is the, we can kind of say that average number of languages uh, in that particular conference can be kind of approximately be two raised to entropy. So here in 1979, around four languages were getting mentioned, whereas in 2019, around 16 languages. So we repeat this for all these set of conferences, which I just discussed. And uh, I mean, one of the things which can be easily observed is that uh, uh, if you see workshops, as well as LREC, uh, these, both these conferences are uh, highly, I mean, the entropy of both these conferences are very high, I think starting around 2000s. So this kind of points to that uh, both uh, LREC and workshops are really inclusive of uh, different languages. 
uh, one of the other observations we see is uh, that in 2015s around uh, there is a spike in uh, the language representation entropy so this might be attributed to um, either massively multilingual models or uh, Uh, or can be possible because of like universal dependencies which were released uh, i think around 2014 or 2015 so one more anecdotal thing which we observed is that the later a conference started uh, the better was the entropy of that conference right so in this case like acl started like pretty much uh, very early so it started off as at a uh, lesser pace compared to that of uh, like say for example nakul right um so uh, i mean in the previous section we saw how language occurrences over the years what we wanted to see here is that how does the language representation compare uh, if you take uh, taxonomy in perspective the taxonomy which pratik already described right so we have uh, like these six classes uh, and uh, a set of conferences so what we do is in each class we have a set of languages and for each conference we have a rank list of the mention of uh, languages in a particular conference so what we have uh, so what we do is that we take a mean reciprocal rank of languages from say the fifth class to that uh, with respect to that of uh, the conference so now in this case we report the inverse mrr value so which means that the uh, lower the inverse mrr value the higher the uh, or, or the more inclusive the conference is so in this case one thing is again uh, we can, i mean one thing which is again observable here is that uh, lrec as well as workshops are very inclusive of uh, uh, languages from these different classes compared to their counterparts so now we have certain numbers from the vanilla statistics uh, of the experiments which we conducted uh, what we wanted to see is how are the dynamics between the authors um, the conferences as well as the languages so in order to do that we have this method called uh, heterogeneous entity embeddings so it's a pretty simple approach in the sense that it works very similar to skipgram what uh, what to work model so what you have uh, here is uh, entity input and uh, for each input we have k sample words from the paper so if i'm taking an example of this paper itself so say pratik is an author or um, or con i mean acl 2020 is a conference right so what we do is uh, give the entity input as say acl 2020 and the objective is to uh, uh, kind of give like five uh, i mean uh, for an example like five words from the paper body so Uh, i mean this gives us entity embeddings the w e cross n is uh, are what the entity embeddings are of n dimensions right so now that we have this uh, entity embeddings uh, we plot it i mean we first uh, reduce the dimensions from n to 2d space and we plotted using i mean uh, using tsni and we plotted to get a spatial understanding of where the conferences are lying so it's immediately again obvious that uh, cl is clustered far to the left and uh, whereas like acl uh, beginning from i think 1983 it's kind of going towards the right so i mean this can be attributed to uh, how theoretical approach how the approach of is cl is more towards theory whereas acl has, is kind of migrating towards a more data driven or empirical uh methods so one more observation which we make is that like there is a long distance relationship between acl uh from the language cluster so these are the language clusters uh languages uh, and this is the language cluster as you can see uh you can see that the acl is kind of uh scraping by uh through that language cluster though it's coming closer towards it so one more thing which i forgot to mention in the previous slide is that uh, uh emnlp as well as nakl all these different conferences uh, have a very similar trend to acl which is why we didn't plot it in this uh, graph but uh, it's available on our web page where um 
uh, we have posted a more interactive visualization. So one more thing which we can see is that LREC is right in the middle of the language cluster, uh, uh, which kind of shows like how focused it is uh, on languages, uh, whereas workshops uh, initially were a bit far and then it's coming closer from, see if you see from 91 to around 2017, you can see how the trend is going towards uh, uh, and settling in between the uh, different languages. So one more thing which we wanted to see is what is the role of community when it comes to upliftment of uh, a language technology, right? So again, we make use of the same entity embeddings. So I'll illustrate the whole process of how we check for this uh, role of the community through this example. So for example, uh, in this case, like we have uh, Hindi as a language entity. What we do is calculate or like uh, find n closest authors, uh, author entities to Hindi. And uh, then what we do is uh, we have, a, I mean, we calculate the n closest uh, language entities to each of the authors. So as you can see for author one, uh, Hindi lies in around third position, whereas author two, it lies around uh, first one, whereas for author n, it's around, and I think it's in the nth position, right? So what we do is try to calculate a mean reciprocal rank again uh, uh, of Hindi uh, with respect to each of these lists. Now we have this uh, uh, MRR metric. What it says is the more the MRR, uh, for example, if Hindi was at a higher uh, end for each of these authors, it shows that uh, there is more focus of a community towards uh, a particular language. So you can see that uh, the class five uh, has like uh, very, I mean, comparatively low uh, MRRs. Whereas if you go to class zero, you can see uh, uh, comparatively higher MRR. So this kind of points out to that not all superheroes wear capes. So uh, there are certain set of people who are uh, really working towards upliftment of uh, certain languages uh, in NLP research. So one of the examples which I want to take, I think everyone would have recently heard about it, is of the Masakhane NLP. So they are really working towards uh, inclusion of African languages to work in NLP research. So, uh, I mean, we have discussed all these different methods. So what are the key takeaways from this? So one thing which we can easily see is that the taxonomy is pretty evident from different analysis which we have done, uh, especially the typological ones, uh, the conference inclusion, as well as the embeddings. So this kind of uh, shows that uh, languages in the lower classes are um, crippled and uh, still require a lot of effort in terms of, uh, I mean, a lot of effort uh, for their survival. The second uh, thing which we see is that uh, of typological consideration. So uh, if we don't, uh, like, if we ignore the typological features that can haunt zero shot systems, so whenever we are collecting data, we should be mindful or collecting data for say, uh, 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 collecting data for a pre-trained model, we should be mindful of the uh, typological, diverse typological features which these different languages have. One more thing which we observe is that the conferences, I mean, especially uh, LREC and workshops are very inclusive of different conference, uh, sorry, different languages. Um, I mean, we can certainly see that some of the other conferences like ACL are really getting inclusive of different languages. However, there is still much more work to be done. And just in the um, previous slide, what we saw is that, I mean, low, re low resource language are still striving for the survival. However, uh, I think one of the issues However, I think one of the uh, issues is that, uh, I, mean, not, I mean, not all languages are still getting attended to. There are still a lot of languages which uh, don't have that kind of attention. So uh, through our work, what we want to do is uh, kind of urge the NLP community to take a more fine-grained uh, look at what amplifies this disparity. So, and how each and every member can kind of contribute towards uh, mitigating this. 
so uh, there can be like uh, several recommendations we received a lot of recommendations in the acl chat as well so one of the recommendation which uh, we point out in the paper is to include the dni clauses uh, so which is the diversity and inclusion process in say uh, paper submission forms or paper review forms so these can ask for uh, say how many languages have you worked on uh, or not just that like uh, uh, i mean is is this particular paper focused on a particular language or not so this would uh, i mean if we take this as a factor of consideration uh, it will motivate researchers to orient their works towards this direction i mean we can already see uh, like a couple of conferences uh, kind of embracing this so like neurips has recently started with the broader impact statement uh, which kind of looks at how uh, like i mean if if you mention about that that kind of shows like whether this particular work is relevant to a broader community or not so um, like when we were uh, actually preparing for this talk uh, i and pratik kind of thought like what is the uh, next uh, direction which is possible one of the things i mean other than uh, i mean uh, inclusion of clauses can possibly be say if we have a dashboard uh, in say acl anthology which kind of keeps track of how different i mean how the linguistic diversity is or keeps the statistics of uh, where we are heading in terms of uh, inclusion of different languages this would be really helpful for people to keep uh, i mean to kind of know where we are heading so um i mean that might be a really good initiative to kind of go forward with so i think uh, i have uh, only these thanks so thank you for attending and we are open for questions thanks to our speakers um i'm going to clap on behalf of everyone because unmuting and clapping never works um so reminder thank sorry you. real quick next week uh, is actually emnlp we're taking a quick break that's right go after learn that. about other work sleep i don't know have a break during this finish up your nacl papers and we'll see you the week after <laughs> yeah, uh, just thank you for everyone to like whoever came for our talk like and we'd be really happy if uh, we can continue engaging because we are still like you know we are still undergrads we want to learn more about what projects everyone is working on um, how specific like which specific languages and respective challenges in those areas Awesome. Yeah, thanks a lot. I mean, it's an honor to be here. <laughs> I mean, considering the lineup of speakers, like all PhD students, I mean, as an undergrad, it just feels very privileged to be giving a talk here. Yeah. Your talk was great, and I think a lot of people find this topic very interesting. So, yeah, thanks for coming on NLP with Fred. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Bye.